afternoon, good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Celia Lowe and I'm the president of the Pearls by the Bay Interest Group, which is an official interest group of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. I wanna say again, thank you for being here. I'm going to um, briefly talk about our target areas. The one in this case is the arts, where Alpha Kappa Alpha has a definite interest in bringing artistic expressions of all kinds to the community. Um, as you all know, we're in a virtual space due to our pandemic. Um, so this is one way by supporting Center Stage and our awesome playwright who is here with us this afternoon and sharing the work of Black women, hair, and politics. Um, when we heard about the play, um, well, saw it on Facebook through Center Stage's um, press, I thought, wow, that's such a great idea. That'd be awesome if we could do a talk back with the writer and some key people in our area that talked about the Crown Act, Black women, our hair, professionalism, and all these things that we may have conversations about in smaller sister friend groups, but it would be awesome to kind of open it up to the broader community. So I want to thank everyone for coming on your Sunday afternoon to have this very, what I know will be amazing conversation. With that, I'm going to send this over to our target chair for the arts, Tia. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us. We're really excited um, that you all could join us for this wonderful occasion. Um, we appreciate you all taking time out. I'm sure it's pretty beautiful outside wherever any of you are. So we really appreciate you all taking this time out and joining us. Um, I'd like to introduce the playwright of the play that we all saw and were in awe of, The Wonderful oh. World of Crowns, Kinks, and Curls, Kelly Goff. Kelly is a multi-platform storyteller who is best known for chronicling the intersections of race, politics, and gender in America. As a journalist and essayist, her work has appeared in publications such as Time, The Washington Post, The Root, Vogue, and S. I can't hear her, but I'm assuming everyone else can. I think that we lost sound. See, oh. Oh. we can't hear you anymore. Maybe. better? Oh, yep. there you go. Yes. If you could just speak up a little bit louder. And go back like maybe about half a paragraph back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I apologize, y'all. Um, a writer and producer on the new Sex in the City reboot. And just like that, Kelly's played the glorious world of crowns, kinks, and curls featuring Black women sharing humorous and heartbreaking stories about their hair is currently available streaming courtesy of Baltimore Center Stage. Kelly has previously written for the television series Twinnies, as well as Black Lightning and Being Mary Jane, for which she was awarded a 2016 NAACP award. Kelly was also no nominated for two, Emmy two news Emmys for her work on the documentary Reversing Roe, which was available on Netflix in 2018. As a journalist, she continues to serve as a contributor to the Daily Beast and to various NPR affiliates, most notably for KCRW's left, right, and center. Born and raised in Texas, Kelly is a graduate of NYU and as well as Columbia University. Thank you very much, Kelly. We welcome you and we look forward to seeing everything that you have to say. Thank you so much for having me. And I apologized earlier. I don't have any uh, pink or green with me here in LA, but I did go, go dig out my pink glasses. Oh. <laughs> But I'm so thrilled to be here and thank you so much for supporting the play. Thank you. All right. So I keep you for our other panelists. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Shakita Jeffries, Vice President and Program Chairman of Pearls by the Bay. And on behalf of my sisters, welcome to our crown and glory, an in-depth look at politics and policing Black women hair and our policing of Black women and our hair. It is so nice to see so many of you here today on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, we are just grateful for your presence today. I wanna take a few minutes to share a little bit of information about our VIPs today. Our first guest is Delegate Stephanie M. Smith. 
Delegate S Stephanie M. Smith is serving her first term in the Maryland House of Delegates, where she represents Baltimore City's 45th State Legislative District. She also chairs the Baltimore City House of Delegation to the Maryland General, Sem General Assembly. Stephanie was the primary House sponsor of Maryland's Crown Act which prohibits workplace discrimination of natural and protective hairstyles. When not serving, when not serving in the legislature, Stephanie works as the assistant director for equity, engagement, and communications in the city of Baltimore's Department of Planning. Prior to joining the General Assembly, Stephanie worked in the federal policy arena, advancing public health, voting rights, affordable health, and environmental justice for the most vulnerable communities. Stephanie is a proud graduate of Hampton University where she earns a bachelor's degree. She's also an alumnus of the University of Delaware where she earns her master's degree and a proud alumni of Howard University Law School where she earned her JD. Stephanie lives with her husband and two young sons in East Baltimore. Please, ladies and gentlemen, give a round of applause to Delegate Stephanie M. Smith. Woo! Next, I would like to introduce Delora Sanchez if 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 I couche if a couche Esquire. Delores. Delora Sanchez Ifacauche Esquire is one of America's premier healthcare policy experts with over a decade of experience advocating for clients' interests before federal and state and local government entities. She joined Cornerstone Government Affairs in October of 2015 after leading Johns Hopkins University and Medical Systems Government Affairs team. Delora has an extensive background in state legislative and regulatory issues. In 2020, Delora was named a top lobbyist by the National Institute for the Lobbying and Ethics, also known as NOW. And this, in the same year, she was appointed by the Howard County Council to the Racial Equity Task Force. Delora was recognized by the Daily Record as part of the inaugural annual cohort of Women Who Lead in 2020 as a VIP, 40 under 40 in 2017, and a leading woman in 2013. In 2014, she was also named a Marshall Memorial Fellow the flagship leadership development program of the German Marshall Fund of the United States. She was also appointed by Governor Martin O'Malley to the Maryland Commission for Environmental Justice and Sustainable Communities. Delora is a proud member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated and serves as a chair of community engagement on the board of directors for THREAD, which engages underperforming high school students facing significant barriers outside of the classroom. As a native of Baltimore, Delora was proud to accept an appointment by the speaker of the Maryland House of Delegates to the South Baltimore Gateway Partnership Board in 2017. The organization is responsible for distributing approximately $8 million in casino revenue for community development projects in the areas immediately impacted by the casino's construction. Previously, Delora was a board member of the Charles Village Community Benefits District and vice chair of the Board for Hope Forward, which provides support transforming for foster youth. Delora also holds a Juris Doctorate degree with a concentration in health law from the University of Maryland School of Law and is an undergraduate degree and has an undergraduate degree in health man in healthcare management from Towson University. She is licensed to practice law in Maryland and the District of Columbia. Delora is a resident of Howard County where she resides with her husband and three beautiful children and cat Sebastian. 
please, ladies and gentlemen, give a round of applause to Delora. Next, last but not least, I would like to introduce Michelle K. Wilson. Michelle K. Wilson is the attorney advisor for the District of Columbia Department of Corrections. Prior to joining district government, Michelle was an assistant attorney general with the Maryland Office of the Attorney General, representing the Maryland Department of Public Safety and Correctional Services and the Department of Labor. Prior to joining the Maryland Attorney General's Office, Michelle was a prosecutor with the Baltimore City State Attorney Office for 10 years, spending her last four years as a homicide prosecutor. Michelle is currently the president of the Alliance of Black Women Attorneys of Maryland Incorporated the first bar association founded by and for black women attorneys. Additionally, she was the president of Monumental City Bar Association, which is the oldest African-American bar association in the state of Maryland. She is also actively serving on several committees within the Bar Association of Baltimore City and the Maryland State Bar Association. Maryland. Michelle has served for two years on the Board of Civil Justice Incorporated. In addition, Michelle is a member of the Carita Committee of the Court of Appeals of Maryland for the Sixth Appellate Circuit. Michelle previously served two years as the president of her local homeowners association. Michelle is also an adjunct faculty member at the University of Baltimore School of Law teaching first year law students legal writing and advocacy. In addition, Michelle teaches graduate and undergraduate business law courses at Strayer University and Jarvis Christian College. Michelle is a proud gra graduate of the University of Maryland School of Law and she received her undergraduate degree from the University of Delaware. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your round of applause, a round of applause together for Michelle K. Wilson. And I would like to just give, um, let us all give at this time a round of applause to all of our amazing VIPs. As you can tell, these ladies are truly embodying Black girl magic. Thank you so much. And I'm going to turn the floor over now to Celia Lowe. Thank you. Hi there, we're gonna turn it back over to Tia. Show is yours, floor is yours. Okay guys, we're gonna start um, our uh, moderating our panel and uh, we're gonna have a couple um, questions that we have pre-planned and the moderators are gonna be Soror Candice Montague and Soror Terry Brown Powell. And um, they're gonna ask some questions of our panel and then after um, those questions are complete, we will um, give our guests an opportunity to ask questions of members of the panel. We ask that you um, use the raise hand option on, uh, on the Zoom and our tech team will make sure that everyone um, who asks a question or raise their hand is able to uh, get, their, get their question um, to whomever it is on the panel that they would like. So I'll turn it over to Sir uh Candace and Terry so we can um, get our panel started. Hi, good, good afternoon, Soros. Uh, having a few technical difficulties, but it doesn't matter as long as you can hear me. Uh, so I'd just like to start off again by thanking you all again for being here, our panelists, as well as our um, viewers. Thank you so very much for giving uh, your time to come to talk about this very impressive production. I really enjoyed it. I watched it twice, actually, and I encouraged several people to watch it and to download it and to do the group view. And there is just a question, and I know you're probably so exhausted of hearing it, Kelly, but what inspired you to write this play? I'll never get tired of answering that, especially for people like this amazing group of women here today. I just want to thank all of you for getting behind this production. I don't think this is talked about enough, but first of all, doing theater is really hard. It's always hard. It's particularly hard during a pandemic. It's particularly hard over uh, on a screen when that's the whole purpose of theater is usually for people to be able to congregate in person. And we all know there's not enough diversity in the American theater. So having people embrace and uplift a play like this 
really matters. And it's the kind of thing I will be forever indebted and grateful to all of you for doing it in such an incredible and extraordinary way. I'm also really honored to even be on this panel with all of these amazing women who, who are out there changing the world on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm just really, really uh, grateful to be here. And I talked so much, I almost forgot the question. What inspired the play? Okay, so what inspired the play is in my previous life, and, it's, and I didn't uh, really mention this in the, in the bio because it really feels like another lifetime ago, I spent a lot of my career as a journalist on air. I have always considered myself first and foremost a writer. It's what I most enjoy doing, um, but particularly during the Obama era, which now feels like a lifetime ago for a lot of reasons that I'm sure everyone relates to. It feels, it feels like a very long time ago. But during the Obama era, I was writing for outlets like The Root and I was blogging for The Washington Post. And you know, part of that whole uh, spiel is also going on cable news. And so that became a regular part of my life is that I was on t television regularly. And um, once I started doing television regularly, I did the thing that a lot of women, Black women who are on television regu regularly do, which is I got hair extensions. I got what um, my friend at the time called my news Barbie costume uh, going, which was my kind of long and big hair extensions. And then, you know, we were all wearing the sleeveless colorful dresses because Michelle Obama was all about the arms. So all of us were doing the sleeveless candy colored dresses. And it really did feel like a costume. Like I remember I was dating someone and I walked into a restaurant and he was kind of like, <laughs> when I when he saw me come straight from a cable news hit because that's not how I look walking down the street or going to the grocery store. And so that kind of became my on-air persona. And when you have a career like that, right, you never know when the call's gonna come that you're needed to be on air. And so that kind of became a huge part of my life, a much bigger part of my life than I had planned for or anticipated or frankly enjoyed. Um, and so the real turning point that inspired this play is whenever I wasn't going to be on air for a couple of days or for a stretch, that's when I would have my hairstylist come over, take the extensions out. And then he'd come back over. Like if I had my last appearance for the week on a Wednesday, he'd come over Wednesday night, take the extensions out. And then I'd say, you know, I got to be back on air Tuesday morning. So you got to come back Monday night, put him back in, make me look like news Barbie again. And he had just left my apartment, literally just left my apartment, was driving home. And I get a call from my agent who I was in New York. She, my TV agent who was based on the West coast. And she said, I have extraordinary news. And I'm like, okay, what is it? And she says, she says the name of the person. It was literally one of the most powerful people in the news business. He just called, he wants to meet with you. He's been following your career. And this in, in our business, it's like the star is born moment, right? It, it is Oprah Winfrey called, she wants to put you in a movie. Steven Spielberg called, they want to put you in a movie. It was like that kind of call that this person could change my life. And I said, are, is this a joke? This is a really mean joke. Cause I was just so stunned. And she said, it's not a joke at all. Um, and the great news is he had a cancellation. So he'll see you at his office at 9 a.m. tomorrow. And I did not look like the news Barbie whose career he had been following. And I did not tell my agent who was white that I had taken my hair extensions out. So I had this kind of like total meltdown and life-changing, you know, I mean, you know, you would have, it was like, I'm sure with the hysterics and the histrionics of, of me calling my mother, be like, oh my God, right. You would have thought like I had done something horrifically bad to sabotage my career. And so the next morning, so, so I did the thing, which I know every black woman, when they hear this is horrified. I actually, the only thing I could do is I went across the street to a drugstore and I bought a $10 ponytail and then I plopped it on my head and put it in. I, I already see the faces of judgment and you're right to judge me for that. You absolutely right. So I slapped the ponytail on. I had a really, you know, bad, I dream of Jeannie thing happening with all these bobby pins in it. And I remember sitting in this meeting and being like, don't lean too far this way. Don't lean too, don't sneeze because the thing might come flying off your head. And then I have the meeting and I, and guess what? The meeting wasn't a disaster because surprise, surprise, he asked me about my political coverage. He asked me about my knowledge of the news. He wasn't like, what's the thing on your head? I might have thought it, I don't know. But I got through the meeting and it was a turning point. And I remember thinking to myself, I don't ever want to spend the seven hours I spent obsessing last night and this morning over this. I don't want that ever happening again. I think it's, it, it just, it was a waste of time and it's bad for my spirit. So I started easing out of wearing hair extensions on air. Not everyone loved that. And that, and, I, that, and I'm not just referring to white people. I had plenty of well-meaning black friends who were sort of like, you know, it's so interesting what you're doing now, but you look so great. You know, la last month when I saw you, you just looked so fabulous on air. There was a lot of that and that's okay. 
And I still, for me, it was no turning back. And so that happened years ago. I never discussed that with anyone. I mean, I, I don't even, I think the only person who knew that that whole drama was my mother. And I never had this kind of conversation. I never felt empowered to do that. And then literally two years ago, Keith Joseph Atkins, who runs something called the New Black Fest in Theater, asked me to read a story, a personal story. And I, I was like, I don't have a story. He's like, first of all, you talk all the time. You always tell stories. So you got a story. You just got to pick the story that is most meaningful to you to tell. And this was the story I shared. And the reaction from the audience, particularly from women, told me that there was more there. It told my agent, who, who had never heard the story, my um, writing agent, that there's more there. And I, and I noodled on it and I said, what if we just did a play that was like the vagina, vagina monologues, but for black women in hair, because every black woman I know has a story like that. And the thing is, there's so much shame attached that in the same way, I didn't tell my black girlfriends about that. We all have stories we don't tell each other. And so that's where the, that's where the, the origin story of the play comes from. And I'm so sorry, I talked so long, but that was sort of the big journey of how we got here. Thank you for that. And I love that story. I think it's absolutely wonderful. And I had no judgment at all because I have been there way <laughs> too many times. So worried about my hair more than the task in front of me. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, yeah. We I think we can all relate to that. Um, so hi, ladies. Um, and I'm Candace Montague, and I am so glad too that you all joined us on a Sunday afternoon to talk about this amazing play. So my question goes to Stephanie and Delora, and I wanted to talk about the Crown Act in Maryland that passed. I know you had some opposition to it, but you also had some support, um, a lot of support actually. And I saw that you had some support even from a couple of male delegates, um, Juwando, jo Will Juwando in uh, Montgomery County. I saw that he um, chimed in and wanted to support as well as uh, Alonzo Washington. I thought that was really fantastic to see Black men supporting us in that kind of endeavor. So I wonder if you could tell us about your role in making that passage of that act happen. Thank you, um, Candace. And also, Kelly, it's been so long since I've seen you. <laughs> it's only been a couple of days, but uh, I'm so glad to rejoin you. Um, I, um, you know, someone who's not here with us, but I want to lift up um, a friend of both um, Delora and I. Um, her name is Adwa Asamoa, and she has really been the national policy um, architect of the Crown Act. So we are fortunate to know her. So when um, I knew that this was something I wanted to bring to Maryland, we went to um, the queen herself, Adwa, and she um, assembled a great team of pro bono lobbyists, including Delora and um, Kimberly Robinson and others. And um, I, I want to say that I wasn't surprised, and I'll let um, Delora speak for herself, that men were supportive of the Crown Act because they're discriminated against because of their hair too. That's why they're choosing not to wear the Afro, the cornrows or the locks that perhaps they wore at some point in their life. And, and the one delegate you did mention, um, Delegate Alonzo Washington, he has locks that are mid back, right? He has very um, meticulously ma maintained and beautiful locks. And um, I watched the play earlier today with my mom and the part where um, the hand is coming towards your head. I've seen those hands coming towards his head. Okay, So he has, he has a story to tell is what I'm trying to say, um, being a, a, a political you know figure with very long um, locks. So um, I think a lot of people just realize that there are times where you are being judged for what's on your head and not what's in your head. And many people just go, oh, well, those are the breaks. And we want to create some legal tools for redress. And we couldn't do that without a law. So I am so thankful for um, Delora. And I can't wait for her to chime in because I had to go before a committee. I generally never bring bills before um, health and um, government operations. And that's where as you heard from her bio, that's her background is going before this particular um, board. And there were many um, people on that committee who don't necessarily understand these issues. And it was really important to make sure that they understood that we were, um, we often hear from some of our friends in the GOP that this is a solution looking for a problem, but we're like, no, this is a problem. <laughs> it's a real life problem. And um, we had to illustrate that for our colleagues and also, um, something as simple as a protective hairstyle. I think some of us had a little chuckle, right? These are newfangled terms that you can have been black all your life. And if you're a person of a certain age or if hair care isn't at the forefront of like your lifestyle, they're like protective hairstyle. 
what are you talking about? So there's little things like that that we had to unpack that seemed minor, but were particularly important so that people understood what the law itself was trying to do, which is, you know, um, prevent discrimination. But I would love to give Delora a chance to speak as well. Thank you, Madam Delegate. Uh, <laughs> I, I just, um, I mean, you've hit a lot of the really good points. Um, and as she mentioned, uh, myself and Kimberly Robinson and Ajwa Asamoa uh, and uh, Delegate Smith met probably what, about five months before session started. And we had a few drinks and we sat around and had a meal and we kind of plotted out how we were gonna get this legislation passed in Maryland. And uh, we were very fortunate. Usually legislation takes a few sessions but one of the great things about the work that I do that I always like is working with people like Delegate Smith, but really having a concept, sitting down and talking about it in uh, late summer, early fall, and then having it go into law by October of the next year, which is really fantastic. And that's what we were able to uh, see happen. And uh, interestingly, the way the bill was assigned in the House and in the Senate was a little bit different. So we had to go before the, the Judicial Committee in the Senate, uh, JPR, Judicial Proceedings. And in the House, we had to go before the Health Committee because it fell, it fell, it fell under government operations, which was a little bizarre. But in any case, um, we certainly ran into a lot more, I'd say, pushback. Uh, in the Senate, even though the Senate bill was sponsored by the chairman of this, uh, the, um, uh, the JPR committee, there were some members of his committee that really kind of wanted to, I I'll say politely be obstructionist. They had these questions like, well, what if someone has braids and they're rainbow colored and they're down to their ankles? Are we supposed to, you know, it was just, it was one of those things that you, uh, you anticipate might happen, but not on the record in a public forum. It was very uh, enlightening. And as Delegate Smith talked about, we had to do a lot of education. Um, what is a protective style? Uh, what kind of discrimination do folks face? Uh, why is this bill needed? And for many people, of course, that do not have to think of, I don't wake up in the morning and shake my hair out and, and walk away and, and I'm okay. And, and I'm okay. It takes time <laughs> to get it together. So um, just having to explain, you know, uh, the, the real uh, kind of labor of love that you have to do to get yourself coiffed um, when you have uh, natural hair and just wanting to present as your hair grows out of your head and not have to worry about discrimination. And, and unfortunately, if you do, there is a vehicle uh, for you to get some redress. It's really, it was the emphasis for the bill. And I think uh, uh, Delegate Smith um, did a fantastic job in, in ushering it through. And now we have the law in Maryland, you know, uh, proudly to be one of the early states to pass the law. So it was fantastic. Okay, great. Um, that was a great answer. Um, I have a question for uh, Michelle. Um, as a black professional woman in the legal field, what does it mean to you to realize that your hair is legislated? Um, what does that mean to you? Because I, I saw that and I thought about the part in the play where the senior attorney was trying to educate and lead the junior attorney to let her know how she needed to look. When I saw that, I'm like, Kelly's in my head because that happened to me about, about that and a few other things, but you know, a senior person trying to let me know, but not even in a gentle or, or kind or nurturing way, more so in a punitive way as it kind of played out, you know, as it played out there. And I think that that is probably more so the way that it typically plays out um, because it's like an animosity that that person, that the senior person has, like the nerve of you to come in here to be yourself when I've had to change and suppress and, and push down myself in order to create this space for you to come and then be yourself. So it's like, even though they showed up to do, they, they broke a glass ceiling, but they broke a glass ceiling in conformity, not, you know, a, a, as a, as a um, oh gosh, you know, just in conformity. And then when someone else is able to come and do what they, you know, what they wanted to have done naturally, like others can do naturally, there is like a negativity and boom, in my mind, it just clicked. When I would come as a, as a younger person to more senior people, it would always be something. And 
for it to be hair as it was in your play, as, as it was in the play and for it to be professional. Uh, as I stated to some people before I worked on Capitol Hill, my um, office administrator or the AA, she always had an issue. She was like, you should straighten your hair. You should wear it pressed. I wore my hair in a, in a, in a, natural, in a natural bun. I've had the same hairstyle my entire life. And it just hurt me. And it left me feeling like, should I walk away from the field or should I stay and just be myself? And as time went on, I won. But what do you think about that? Good afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon. Girl, that was a lot. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Uh -oh. I was like, okay. You got a lot. Give up her chest. Okay. That's why they picked me. No, no, no. I mean, the I think it's very therapeutic. It was such a it's such a passionate topic, and so I just want to first thank you so much for having me here and allowing me to see the play and I watched it this morning my husband was trying to talk to me I'm like I'm, I'm in the middle of something right now right and so I um I, I I just wanted to tell you that I loved it and it's it definitely so many time. parts just it, Terry as it spoke to you there were so many parts that spoke to me that scene as the attorney senior attorney talking to the younger attorney and also the, the, the victim because I was a prosecutor. And mm -hmm. I just kept thinking about my role when I was a prosecutor and how I talked to victims and how I talked to them about preparing them to testify and, and thinking, did I do that? Did I make someone feel that way? That, I mean, the, the horror, the thought of it um, was, you know, it really touched me, you know, and, and it makes you think over and over again of how you treated people and what you, what you do. I will say in, in answer to parts of your question, I, I guess my mindset, I've always thankfully worked and had bosses that did not pol personally police my hair in, in the sense that at least they didn't say it to me. Um, and I also was very cognizant of my mother um, early in, when I was growing up, worked at law firms. So all through my childhood, not as a lawyer, she was in the word processing department. You know, she is suffering from carpal tunnel syndrome after years of, of typing up all of the attorney um, documents. But she was very mindful when I became a lawyer to, and, and, and talk to me about presenting yourself and what to wear and all that. And, and the mother conversation with cutting the hair. I mean, when I went natural many, many years ago, before I say it was popular to be natural, my mother was like, well, what is that going to look like? You know, and when I said I cut off my hair, she was like, this was before FaceTime when you could say, you know, I said I cut off my hair. She was like, and so what does that mean? What are you, you going to do with it? And, you know, and, you know, so I was in law school when I did that. And then at my first job out of law school, I clerked with natural hair. And then I was hired by this, at the state's attorney's office with natural hair. So it was it was accepted. And then when I relaxed it again, no one said anything. And then when I put it in braids, no one said anything. But what I, for me, what I learned is I, I was always prepared. I walked into court every day and I would always say, I'm prepared to go to trial. I have my heels on, my, my I don't wear suits, but my outfit on ready for trial. And, you know, I remember a judge commenting to me, like, you always look ready, Miss Wilson. You always look like you're ready to go to trial. Even if I had no witnesses, I was ready. I was, I because you had to put on, the, we had, to, I felt like I had to be ready. My colleagues who would, um, of different races who would show up to work that day in their flats and with their hair wet and in a bun, talking about I didn't comb it today. I didn't have, I didn't feel like I ever had that luxury. I couldn't be I could never be not ready. And, you know, I think Dolores said, you know, the time it takes for us to be ready in the morning, I, you, we had to be ready. That was factored in time. You know, you got to wake up an extra 20, 30 minutes, you know, that segment where you talk about Hillary Clinton, we have to wake up and factor in that hair time and that makeup time and all those things. And so I've done that, but working in, in, as a lawyer as for the state and many times in, offices where I was maybe one or two of the minorities in the office and having to explain to people, you know, I remember a case where they were upset because somebody wore a head rag to, to they were wearing a head rag to the office. And what does that mean? And, and, and I'm like, well, what are, what are you talking about? Like, what? You know, and having to say, you know, always being the person or one of the people who says, 
you know, you want to be careful with what, what language you use. You want to be careful with what you say. Um, what, you know, like, let's be mindful of what we're talking about and having, so I've never personally been policed, but you're always aware of when we are being policed. And so, and, and sometimes having to be that voice in the room as the lawyer. So when you talk about whether or not you wanting to be there anymore, I sometimes feel like we have no choice but to be there because somebody has to speak for us because too mm -hmm. often people, no one will. If there's only one or two of us in the room, if no one else will speak for us, someone has to be there in offices to speak for us. You know, going now to District of Columbia government, I, I mean, no one asked me about my hair at all. I mean, I, I, I've had a different hairstyle. Sometimes I think on Zoom calls every other day, it's up and down, it's around, it's twirled around and, and no one, they're probably it's, asking you where you got it done. Exactly, you know. <laughs> and so no one says anything about it, but to know that and there are so many spaces where we're underrepresented or um, there's not a lot of us, we need those people in the, we need us in those spaces to, to say, no, you cannot say that, you know? And, you know, even when I talk about being a state's attorney's office, I would say to colleagues in trial, just because someone said the words don't mean doesn't mean you repeat it like you know you don't have to say it you don't you know that doesn't give you the freedom and and it's the same thing with our hair and our bodies and our clothes but i just feel like we are always have to be ready we have to be at a different level than a lot of other people because they're looking at us to say oh you're not ready and what does that mean and what does that look like and so you know, and so I, I just, there were so many different parts of the play that spoke to me because it, it was just more than just, you know, just when the two women were getting ready for the funeral, like just to be, have to be ready, like that quiet moment beforehand, when you got that peace and that quiet, and then knowing when you left your house, you, you are putting on your mask and your shield and your cape and having to be ready. It just, it just resonated. And so I, I thank you for that. Thank you so much for all the work you do. I thank you for that response. That was really good. And I know what you mean about DC government and working in DC, they, you know, they're a little more relaxed, <laughs> which is a good thing. So my next question is for Kelly. Um, and I wanted to know that the, the monologue where um, the young lady is dating the man who is running for student government president, Ascari versus Grant Pierre, Ascari yes. character. Shaka <laughs> from different worlds. Yeah. Gaza, Gaza from different world, yeah. Yeah, hilarious. I, I actually kind of cracked up about that a little bit because I, I thought that was funny because he does put, kind of put you in the mindset of Dap from school days where yeah. Dap wanted his girlfriend to look this way. And then she came back and said, you know, and accused him like, you just want me to look like this to fit your image. And I wonder if you could talk, kind of talk about how, what lesson you wanted the audience to learn from that, from that scenario there where the boyfriend or the male in the woman's life, you know, kind of, kind of helps, well, not helps, but kind of shapes her decisions or kind of weighs in on her decisions. What do you think about that? What do you want the audience to learn? Well, the first thing is that, you know, we can never win, right? Which is, that's actually really what that piece is about, is I want to use humor to convey the fact that Black women can never win. If we don't, if we wear her natural, someone at work has something to say. If we get a blonde weave all the way down to our backside, someone questions our politics, we can never win. So we, first of all, should stop being so hard on each other. And I've done this. I'm totally guilty of doing this too over the years, right? Like, and so, and, and, and by the way, doing the things subconsciously, even if I haven't said it out loud about someone's like identity, right? Like, well, if they're so proud of being black, well, I'm wondering why she does this, this, and this. Maybe because she felt like it. Maybe because she just wanted, she saw a celebrity with great, I did this over the, um, you know, I saw some celebrity who had the really long um, box braids. I love the gold coloring. I was like, I don't know if that works for me, but I'm going to order the wig online, try it out in a mirror and see. You know what I mean? Like we have a right to do that without someone saying, are you proud of being black if you're wearing these braids, right? And yet, and so that's really what that one was about is using humor to say we can never win. So we should be trying to make ourselves ha happy, not everyone else, including our man. And so that was the first thing. And the other thing too is, I, there are so few depictions, not just of Black people, but of Black men in the American theater. And so I wanted to be really conscious of depicting Black men with nuance. Um, you know, this is clearly a woman-centered play, but one of the things I was really adamant about, um, and I, 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 I'm sorry if I mentioned this earlier, um, I've done a lot of these talkbacks, so sometimes my talking points are blurring a little bit together. But what I was going to say is, 
is, you know, one of the conversations that one of the notes I got early from someone well-meaning at the theater is we want to be conscious of the Bechdel test, which of course is, is how we track women characters and making sure women characters are not presented only in like of the lens of, of the male gaze, right? So for instance, in movies, we all know that there are a lot of films where the woman's only the hot girlfriend or the mom and, and she doesn't have her own journey. And so that's very much not what this play is, but one of the things I was very clear with them on is I've never been a little white girl. I've never grown up in a white household, so I can't speak to that. But what I can say very much as a black woman who has you know, plenty of black female relatives and friends is a lot of our identity and how we see ourselves doesn't just come from outside culture, but from the men and boys we're raised with, right? So me having relatives who joked about my nappy hair growing up, right? That helps define how I view what happens here, right? But the flip side, and one of the things I really wanted to convey via particularly the last monologue with the little girl is the flip side of that is I had a father who came from a very light-skinned family who always talked about how gorgeous my darker mother is. And that imbued me, I now realize as an adult with the armor that allowed me to go on cable news. And even though I, I bought the hair extensions, I wasn't going to allow someone to run me off and make me think I feel ugly because I didn't look like someone else, right? And, and so I really wanted to, to plant this idea throughout the play of it's about the sisters, but it's also about the brothers and how the role that they play in shaping our, our views of ourselves. And so, and I wanted to do it with nuance and not just make it, you know, no pun intended, black or white. And so that's really what that piece is about is that, you know, you have the athlete that kind of, there was a stereotype about who he is, but politically he was, and of course the subtext is, in the same way, I don't want someone judging who I'm dating, which is the white lady, right? The, the white student. I'm not judging how a sister wears her hair. And meanwhile, the other guy who was so focused on my politics are right is like, but I'm going to tell my, my honey how to wear her hair. So that's really what I was trying to get at is we can never win. And it's complicated, right? Before we judge and assume it's complicated. It's always so complicated. Yeah. Thank you Candace, for that. Can I, can I add something, Candace? Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Because um, that particular um, story uh, reminded me of undergrad. I went to Hampton University, um, late 90s, early 2000s. So there were people that were giving themselves new names. In fact, they were born with names like Grant, and now they have these new like <laughs> names or whatever. And um, they were they were trying out a new person, right? And people do that when they go to college. You try out a new person. So when I um, first entered college, I didn't have locks, but I locked my hair um, early on um, in my sophomore year. And it was just crazy to see how people would react to you differently just because your hair changed. I got invited to all like these raw food, hoedowns, poetry. <laughs> I like poems, you know, before, but I guess, I guess no, <laughs> I liked poems before. And I'm like, this is wild. And then like guys thought I was going to be like Erica Badu. They thought I was going to be... <laughs> I mean, I was making like pork chops one day and this guy's like, you eat pork chops. I'm like, sorry to disappoint you. Like, and then I remember I said like Whitney Houston was my favorite singer. Whitney Houston, I'm like, yes, I like Whitney Houston. I need just a regular person that has lots. So people do project is what I'm saying. All of these things onto you um, that might not necessarily be real. And it, it, sometimes it's harmless, but even the pickup lines, it's like, I'm feeling your kinetic energy. What, just ask for my name and number. Like, why, why all of this new stuff? So it was just interesting. I think people have simmered down in 20 years, but I thought that was fascinating. <laughs> yeah, it's our people that inflict these stereotypes on us. Like, with, don't you know us? <laughs> you are us. Uh -huh. I'm gonna throw it over to my Thor, Tia. Tia, <clears throat> sorry. So, so I have another another question, and this is for everyone. Again, uh, Kelly, I really appreciate you creating this uh, so that we can have the conversation. You know, this is the, the 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 art that we can talk about, that we can converse, that we can discuss, that we can pick apart, that we can identify with, that we can sympathize with others with. And I wanted to just you know ask the question: um, How do you feel? that your piece or how do you all feel on the panel that this piece will affect the conversation i remember the um say sora uh, in legislate and the um uh, delora mentioning that some of the other members were saying that this is legislation looking for a reason you know but there it, it, it is a reason so my, my question again is 
what conversation do you think this has started? What conversation have you heard that you did not anticipate? And what conversation do you think can continue to come out of this? I want to defer to the to the the political leaders on this one. So I will I will let them take it away. So Delore, or Stephanie or Michelle. Okay, I, I, I guess I'll jump for in. everyone. I think what was interesting is our bill got finalized in the rise of the pandemic. We actually had to end the legislature about three weeks early. So we were just thankful that this is one of the bills we were able to get across the finish line um, with a shortened session. So then the intervening year, I think a lot of people have become more sensitive to things that maybe their friends and colleagues have been going through that they had never considered, the microaggressions, you know, all of these things that might've just seemed like normal. That now they're realizing, hmm, maybe mm -hmm. I've been part of, um, you know, kind of upholding a status quo that is harmful to black people and to um, black women at the intersections of two, you know, identities that are marginalized by the culture. So I think, um, I'll be frank, some of the people that Delora mentioned in the Senate that said some highly questionable things. They almost are essentially begging to say, when can I discriminate? You know, they're basically searching for what is the permissible moment of discrimination here? So I don't think any of those people have necessarily been moved, but I do think there are some folks that um, thought of themselves as good people, um, mm -hmm. and even some of them being black, that are, are starting to question notions of what does professionalism even mean? because I think a lot of us have been told that to be professional, you have to look a certain way. And I often you know, share this with my white friends and colleagues as an, as an example. In white world, you're a nerd because your hair is curly and you have glasses. But by the end of the movie, your hair is straight. <laughs> And you have in contact, you have contact lenses in. So that's their version of like, you know, what's what you're hot or you're not. But um, with black people, it, it's a little more complicated than that. But I try to give something accessible for them to say, why should someone have to get rid of those curls they were born with? Why should someone, you know, have to put in contact lenses if they look perfectly fine in classes? It might seem superficial, but you have to meet people where they are. So I think some white people, they're taking a step back and thinking, when I remark to my colleagues' hair, when I remark to even my friends' hair, when I touch the hair, oh my God, I think there's a little bit of horror that has washed across <laughs> a lot of people over this past year as they thought about things they never ever thought about before. And our bill was an introduction to that conversation. Can I just piggyback really quickly for before Please. Delora walks in? I'm so glad you said that because it's so interesting. We had a we had big conversations about the target audience for the play when we were getting it off the ground. And there were some people who were like, there's enough theater for, for white people. This is really for the sisters. And But what I always go back to as a writer is one, something my editor once said, which is, do you want to it, it, um, get your, do you want to get your emotions off your chest, right? Do you want to get your anger and your pain off your chest, Kelly? Or do you want to try to get other people to think a little differently? Which is not always the same as changing someone's mind. Sometimes it's just opening the door that I never thought about that. Mm -hmm. And that's, kind of where I began to focus as a political columnist is not saying I can get someone to change the way they vote. But if you can get someone to say, I actually didn't realize that that makes me a jerk. And I didn't realize it till I read an example of how it affects someone else. You have moved the needle, right? And that's kind of what I try to focus on in the arts. It's one of the reasons I, I have transitioned from traditional journalism to screenwriting, because it's much easier to do that, frankly. Someone is laughing. And then as in the middle of the laugh, they go, wait a minute, I think I've done that. I literally, the thing I'm laughing at, I actually did that to someone, right? And I have to tell you, I have been hearing that. And, and, and so to your point, I mean, a retired politician <laughs> was white. Um, who, Hello, I love that whoever's dog just weighed in. Um, but a retired politician who was white emailed and said, I learned so much just in this 90 minutes that they didn't know. And one of the things that's come up that's been interesting is the scene between the two black attorneys has not just resonated with black women. It's the scene I've heard the most about from white people because I don't think they realize that these are the conversations we have in private because of institutions that they have created. They did not realize that this is the kind of thing that happens behind closed doors. Similarly, the scene I've heard from a lot, back to Stephanie's point about the people who, don't, who aren't looking to learn, okay, they're probably not gonna see the play, but the people I'm focused on are the people who believe I'm a great ally, I donate to the right, right causes, I read White Fragility three times, I referred it to my friends, and yet, and still, I saw nothing wrong with someone saying to my colleagues, they have to chemically burn their skin 
to work here. And that is part of why we open with the first scene of someone facing the reality of you can get the job, but you have to change your hair or you can stay who you are and not burn yourself and not get the job. And not just any job, but a job that can change your life. I think we, some of us would be surprised how many non-Black Americans did not know those are the choices we face. They genuinely didn't know that that's what it comes down to until they saw it on the stage. So that's why, that's fundamentally my hope for the play is I want Black women to feel seen and to feel loved um, and for, for them to know that you are not alone. We've all been there, even if we haven't talked about it, right, to each other. But I also do want people who are in positions to go, I didn't realize I was part of the problem. And now I want to try to be even a small part of the solution. That's my hope. So that's part of why I hope the play um, has a life beyond this production. And I'm so sorry, Delora, I talked so long because I do want to hear oh, for those of you who are doing the work, what you think we could do with the play to try to help make a difference. I, you know, I think it really has dovetailed into a lot of what I was going to comment on. I mean, hats off to you in the play. I thought it was fantastic. Um, I think you covered so much ground in 90 minutes, right? Because, you know, we have so, there's so much attached to our hair and the fact that you were able to see it from so many different perspectives and then, you know, put that across through art was really phenomenal. Um, but even when we were uh, providing testimony and things on this bill, it actually, it, you could have ripped that right from, you know, the, the public record because we had so many black women and men that came and provided testimony and told their stories and talked about why this was needed. I mean, it didn't even occur to many people that, oh, you actually have to do things to your hair to get it to be straight. You mean, I, oh, I didn't realize that, nor did I realize that it was a very dangerous chemical that you had to do right. to do it, right? Um, none of that ever occurred to anyone. And then the question that we got pretty frequently was, okay, well, someone didn't like your hair. What else? You know, like, it's just like, okay, but they don't have, they didn't have until, you know, like one of the ways this, this play really, I think could be effective for people watching it and listening to it um, is, you know, just so much ingrained, just the, the young girl praying, you know, praying to be pretty. You know, um, that really was, I mean, and even uh, the, the e each one, I think everybody could identify with. I mean, what hit me the hardest was I'm a new mom and I was, I am suffering from postpartum hair loss. And what does that mean for what I can do with my hair or what I, you know, what, how I'm going to present at work or what options I have for how I want to wear my hair, right? So I think um, it, it is good. It's good not just for you know, women who are the subject of the play to watch, but for everyone to watch, really, there's a lot to take away from that. And I do think during testimony, a lot of folks had realizations like, oh, this could affect your livelihood. This could affect your work. People are getting fired. People are getting passed up for promotions. People are getting passed up for, you know, entering into a position that they've been working so hard for all of their lives. It never even occurred to them. I mean, because it hasn't had to. Um, so uh, I think that is the, the powerful thing about it is not just sharing those stories where everyone's like, okay, it's not just me that's dealing with this. And then also for people who don't have uh, ha hair that they have to worry about in under circumstances like this, seeing how this can really, really affect people, not just, oh, I'm upset that you don't like my hair. It goes so much deeper than that. And Delora, can I tell you what you just reminded me of, which I, this is, did not make the play. And I really had not thought about this until we started doing these talkbacks that this happened. But um, before I became a journalist, I worked in politics for a bit. And um, I have a spot on my head that I, I think all of us have this spot where I got a chemical relaxer young and yeah. in a severe burn. <laughs> and, it, and it burned so badly that for the rest of my life, when I get braids, when I get whatever, they're like, no, no, that's not tender headed. That spot's just gonna, it's just a mess in that spot. That one spot is always gonna hurt. It's mm -hmm. always gonna, you're gonna, you know, it's just always gonna be painful in that one spot whenever you do something to it. And I remember when I was still working in politics, the person um, who was my supervisor, I, I think I had just gotten a relaxer and it had burned a little, but not, you know, I have the spot. And I was talking about, I said, you know, we gotta go through this whole thing. We gotta get, Relax her, she didn't know any of that. And she looked at me and said, well, you know, Kelly, when I was in a law firm, we had to wear our hair pulled back in like a ponytail or a bun. So we all got to do stuff, you know? 
Yeah. And this is, and I, this was one of my very first jobs. So, and the fact that she did not realize not the same, right. That you putting a ponytail holder in your head is not the same as me going to a salon for hours <laughs> and then being opening myself up to being chemically burned. Right. So mm -hmm. it is, so that is to your point about the lack of education. And I'm, and the further I go along, I'm realizing how many people just don't know stuff. They just don't know how much it costs and how much energy it requires to be black just before you leave your house, literally before you leave your house, like the amount of effort that's put into it all. So in the effort to present in, in white spaces also, right? It's it's a lot. And, and some of our own, Delora, because right, I, I've yeah, shared this very right. much before that the people who were hardest on me when my, my edges didn't look right when I was on cable news, it was, you know, it was us, people trying to be helpful, right? People trying to be helpful. I'm a fan. You should not be going on TV looking like that. <laughs> it just Even though I was talking about the rape kit backlog, one time it was, I was talking on air about trying to move the needle on the rape kit backlog, which is one of the most important stories I've covered. One of the things that meant the most to me, and there were women who were like, yeah, you really should not have gone on air looking like that today. That's just not, you know, it's not professional. So if I could say, I, I think what you all are saying is that we had to fund them. this, this act, I think maybe forced us, not just us, but uh, our workforce, our to, to consider what is professionalism, you know, so often people want to, when we're policing black hair and talking about what does professional hair look like, you know, when you talk about pink, green and all those things and coloring your hair and having braids, all different colors, what, what about people who have uh, their natural hair, pink, green, and all different colors. And, and, and we don't want to have those conversations. I mean, I think what was so timely about this bill, and I, I think one of the reasons it passed, is I think it speaks to where we are as Black women in society, the, the power, the influence. I think we're starting to recognize our own voices when a lot of times we haven't recognized our voices and the power of our voices and the need to say, I am still a professional, no matter what my hair looks like I can I'm still my my quality of work and the quality of work that I give and I perform doesn't go to whether or not my hair is in a protective style whether it's relaxed whether or not it is you know like I, I could tell you within the just the African-American community when I went from having natural hair for about seven or eight years and decided to relax my hair I I I mean the pushback I got from from African American, why would you do that? You know, and I, you know, I would say I was natural before it was popular, and now I don't want to be. And then now, now when I win, I know you can't. And now when I switch back and I'm natural again, you know, it's 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 you know like. But I'm like, I also will say on a different note that I think there is a power to our not to our ability to change our hair and to change our look and to be oh. one thing one day and somebody else the, the next and still be the same, still be powerful. And, and I think I, and maybe there's a level of jealousy when people comment, oh, you changed your hair again. Well, yes, I did. And yes, I did. And do you like it? Like, you know, <laughs> and I'm not really asking your permission and, you know, like, and I don't need your money to do it. Like, you know, and, and I just think that there's a power to it that I have, I've embraced. And I will tell you, you know, I'm all about self help and therapy. And one day I went to my therapist and someone in the waiting room commented on my hair. And my therapist said, you know, they always comment on our hair because they are, they want to do, because the fact that we can change it on a dime and on a whim and be it, to me, it's the power of it. You know, I, this is how I feel today. And this is how I look. And I, you know, and so, but I am still the same professional individual that I was when I walked through the door yesterday as I am today. And, um, you know, so I, I, you know, I look at it as a, a source of power as well, because then I think it speaks to our power and to be able to do it. Okay, ladies, thank you so much um, for your participation in this. Oh, we lost your sound again. We lost your sound again. Oh, still gone. Can't hear you. Uh oh. All righty, I'll jump in. Someone maybe sent you a little text. We lost okay. the sound again. Well, we're going to entertain some questions from the audience um, because we've seen the the chat box was really jumping. Um, lots of good comments. You know, everyone enjoying the play. 
I know I want to know where part two and part three, when that's coming. So we want to give our audience, that's one of the signatures of um, if, you really, if you really mean that, let the theater know because- we, Oh, we will. I think, I think Stephanie heard this the other night, but the, the original draft, half the stories got cut. Oh, oh we will, we're on it, we're yeah. on it. <laughs> um, but we wanted to give our audience one of the signatures of our events is that we like a lot of audience participation so like they're not being talked at um but they were really engaged in the chat box i can't keep up with the chat but <laughs> what we want to do is if you have a question just use the raise hand feature and we'll call on you and we'll let you speak to our wonderful uh, playwright attorneys delegates so that you can ask the questions directly if not we had plenty of questions just on our own. So if you don't have it, if you have a question, just use the raise hand feature. Nope, everybody was chatting in the chat box. Okay. Can, can I raise? If you don't. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. I see Raina. Excellent. You can ask on mute. Hi, everybody. Hi. I did not get to, I got through maybe like an hour and 20 minutes of it. So I didn't get to finish the last 30 minutes, but I thoroughly enjoyed the play. And it always, whenever there's these types of discussions about natural hair, I always get triggered because I think it's more than a hair thing. I also think it's a colorism mm -hmm. aspect to it. Mm -hmm. So even as a child, you know, neither side of my family wanted to claim my hair texture. Right. I also was in middle school and, you know, middle school is probably like the worst time for an adolescent. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's when Martin was out and talking to Pam. And so I'm walking around being called BDB. BDB. So it would be summertime and I'm walking around with a turtleneck with a bobby pin Aww. picking at my neck because I'm being made fun of. Mm -hmm. I also, you know, I've been told my hair is a waste of light skin. So, you know, there's, yes. So because no, I'm I've, I've heard, I'm friends with Michaela Angela Davis and she talks yeah. about that being one of the. And, and, and the thing is, you know, I used to enable, in order for me to feel better about myself, I used to say, well, you know, I got one foot in the masses house and one foot in the field. So they don't know where to put me. But that was how I tried to make myself feel better because my hair didn't necessarily correlate to my skin complexion as to what everybody else thought. And when I decided to go natural, my grandmother was like, now, you know, you ain't got that good hair to not be getting it prepped, you know, not be getting it permed every four weeks, because that's how often I was going. So I mm. appreciate these types of discussions because I'm trying to do my best with having my daughter feel mm -hmm. good, not only about her body image, but feel good about her natural hair mm -hmm. to not to where she wants, like, yes, yeah, she wants Elsa hair. What? I mean, it's a Disney movie. Of course she wants Elsa hair because she likes Elsa because she wants to be frozen. But also to understand you're a little brown girl. This is the crown that God gave you. Mm -hmm. You see mommy with locks or as she calls it, line hair. I want you to appreciate who you are because I didn't appreciate me until I decided to say, I'm, I'm done with getting my hair, you know, permed and, you know, doing all these things to feel like, I should fit in with what people think my complexion is supposed to represent. So that's all I wanted to say. I didn't necessarily have a question, but I just wanted to thank you for, yeah. you know, this presentation. Because if my daughter was old enough, I was she wouldn't get it right now because she's only five. But it's something that I try on a daily basis to tell her, your hair is beautiful. I wish I had hair like oh. yours. And she actually does have my hair, but she wouldn't know it because my hair is locked. But thank you so much for this production that you put together because it's very timely and it will remain timely. Mm -hmm. So thank you. If I could say, if I could say a piggyback, Raina, you 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 spoke to me because I growing up, I, I am the light-skinned child with 4C hair. And um, so that speaks to me and everything. My mom was, I was at that kitchen table getting that pressing comb, and then two days later. You know, if it was two days, if it was two days, if I was lucky, it was two days that it lasted. And before, and she was in the sixth grade, she was like, you need to go to that beauty salon and get a relaxer. And, and it fell out, you know? And so I, I don't, I'm not as wedded to my hair because it fell out as a child, 
but um, when I was a teenager and had to get it cut off and I cried and I was like, I'll never cry about my hair again. And I cried one other time in my lifetime. And I'll say this, it was when I went to a beauty salon and my hair was falling out in law school mm -hmm. and I asked her to cut my hair off. And the, so the, I said, please just cut it off because I'm so stressed with law school, it's too much. And I said, please just cut it off, it's too much. And she wouldn't do it. She said, I'm gonna give you an updo. And I don't do updos that well. And I went in my, she put this updo in my head, Baltimore updo, I'm from New York. She put this Baltimore updo in my head with this slick back. And I, I got in the car and I cried my whole way home. And I cut my hair off after that. And, and, and it just, ever since then, I was like, I will never cry about my hair being this, you know, have this power over me because I cannot, you know, you cannot give that power. I can't give it all of this, you know? And I am the black girl with the 4C hair and I'm okay with that, you know? And I tell people that all the time, don't look at me to have long hair because that's not what's, when I take these braids out, that's not what's there and that's okay. And I'm okay with that. You know, my husband's okay with that. And <laughs> we're good, you know. Oh, and man. to embrace that is so hard because to say I'm okay with this, with who I am, you know, like there's so many other things we have to fight and battle. And I don't want to battle anybody about my hair and what I look like. And so to have this legislation and to have, I mean, I still, you know, part of the legislation is a battle because then you have to call people out for, for trying to, to, to talk about your hair, but if that forces people to say that's not acceptable and they learn and it doesn't even get to the point of legislation, then that's the good part, you know, because you cannot do it. I'm still a professional is what I always say, you know, and don't, don't legislate my hair, you know. Now, Michelle, what is 4C hair? Um, it's tightly coiled. Um, Michelle, you're muted. Michelle, you're muted. Hair. It's, it's, it's probably what we call like super nappy. So yeah. there's, I, I, yeah, and I want to say this, there's a reference in the digital program. I believe we do have a, a bit of the yes, reference. Yes, we uploaded that and we, yeah. So it summarizes the different hair textures and I- Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah and I, I have to say, someone actually um, asked specifically about exploring hair loss for medical conditions more. That was on the list of scenes that did not make the final cut for this oh, person, but was in the original draft. Good. But I also want to say that there was a whole section. Um, there, there actually, it was originally- in the the Wanda and the campaign with Ascari, there was someone who pops in to explain the concept of nappy and they used the chart okay. of the 3B, the 4C. Wow. There was a lot that got cut, you know, that the, we're hopeful that once live theaters open again, mm -hmm. you know, a, a, a two hour, 20 minute play is not actually long when you're in a theater and you have mm -hmm. an intermission, but people felt the theater and I, and I, I respect, I think they actually turn out to be right that in, in the world of the era of Zoom fatigue, we really wanted to make it 90 minutes so that we could have the play and then have conversations like this afterwards because we've done a lot of these. But but I got you and I see you there. That's where the play of the original draft came from is all the different stories. And then when we were, it, you know, it, I know I'm being dramatic, but this is how writers are. It does feel like choosing your favorite kids and saying, mm -hmm. and two months ago, there were kids. I was like, absolutely not. They are making it to the lifeboat with me. And then they were so tough on me with the like 90 minutes, 90 minutes, 90 minutes. And then it was finally like, mommy, sorry, you know, that you're not going to make it here. So it's always heartbreaking for me when people go, well, why don't you have a story? And I'm like, I did. I promise you I did. So hopefully a sequel, a trilogy, we don't know, yes. but there's lots of stories that we didn't get to include. In definitely, this definitely, definitely. Okay, oh, we have a um, submission. Hi, um, this question comment is um, for Kelly. I really enjoyed the 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 play. I watched it with my daughter who's seven and oh, um, wow. I okay. intend, yeah, I intend to watch it with her again and to discuss it more in depth with her. But um, my question is where, I know you talked about your inspirations, but the stories, uh, where did you get your stories from? Because one of the stories, particularly the one with the attorneys um, that really resonated with me because I've been natural over 10 years and, um, you know, when I decided to go natural, one of my coworkers, who's a good friend of mine, was really adamant about me just, no, don't do it. I don't think it's a good oh, idea. No. Oh, yeah. It wasn't as contentious as that scene, but I definitely can relate to that particular scene because I went through that with a good friend of mine. And she really pleaded with me to, um, you know, not go natural and particularly when I decided to lock my hair she said do not lock my hair so my question is um 
are your stories of the scenes, are they personal experiences, a uh, majority of them, or are they just, you know, just stories from black women that you, that you know? So uh, none of them are based on 100% real life people. But what I would say is that the real life moments that either I have experienced or friends have told me are sprinkled throughout the play. So for instance, one of the main examples I give is the one that's about um, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle's wedding. The, the line about, do you want to see my C-section scar is a real line someone said because someone was questioning whether their very fair biracial daughter was theirs. Um, and I have a very close friend whose daughter is not even biracial, but her daughter is fairer than she is. And she could be dressed in a fur coat and people would say, are you, you know, assume she's the nanny. And this has happened multiple times to her, multiple times, literally dressed to the nines. And people are still like, will you tell her mother, blah, 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 blah. And she was like, speaking to her mother. So that's what I mean to so sprinkle throughout the play or real life moments. One of the things we tried to do though, with the, especially when the cuts process turned really, really painful and it was very heartbreaking because of all of the reasons I just conveyed in looking in the chat is when we would cut things, I would say, but there's a woman who needs to hear that. She's going to miss, if we don't do that scene, she's not going to feel seen. And they're like, but we can't see everyone in this production. So let's just put it to the side. And then in future productions, we can put that one back in. But so what I would often do then is say, well, what's the most important line to me from that scene? And can I put it in somewhere else? So I will speak to the person who asked about, for instance, hair loss. Um, that was a whole monologue, a woman sharing her story and what it did to her life um, after getting sick. And when it was clear, we can't save that scene. We do not have the bandwidth or the real estate. That is when we turned it into an audio bit with the mother um, to talk about postpartum hair. So it's basically a combination because the postpartum hair loss was a separate scene. And then the woman who loses her, her hair because of cancer, those were separate scenes. And then we basically, so that's what kind of happened throughout the process is so it's really a mixed bag. And then the last thing I would do is I would ask, uh, myself and then kind of talk with Bianca Laverne Jones, who's who's um, black woman director, did a great job. Um, I would talk with her. And then the, well, the theater, we'd all talk about like, you know, fundamentally, what is it that I wanted someone to take away? So like, if I could only give, allow myself five takeaways from the 90 minutes that this was condensed to, which stories did I think were really important to be seen because someone wasn't going to see them or hear them somewhere else and they could help. Um, and, and so, you know, it was interesting because uh, uh, Jack Moore, who's a dramaturg, um, stepped in and I worked with him at the public when I had my fellowship there. He's a white male. And so it was interesting having him come in because he knew so little, which is part of why I wanted him to be involved in the process, to be like, that I knew, that I've, I knew nothing about that, so that I could kind of gauge, okay, I know Black women know this story. So I don't need to tell them that story. They, they, they got that and they feel seen similarly in a different thing. But if white people know this, but don't know this, I want them to get to see this. And then it was just a combination of kind of putting a puzzle together and then hoping for the best, you know? Um, so yeah, very long-winded answer to your question about how we ended up landing on the final stories. Okay, we have a question um, that was put in the uh, chat box. Um, it is for Stephanie and Delora. They want to know if the Crown Act applies to children who are in school, school age children. I think Delora may have answered it in the chat. I, I, I couldn't keep up. Okay. Yeah, the answer was yes. Yeah, yeah. I was about to say, yeah, I think she. she and, and, but that was Delegate Smith's kind of, um, we had the bill, the bill was drafted and a lot of times, once you have the bill drafted, time is ticking. You want to you want to drop it in a hopper, and she pulled it back, and she said, uh, "I just need to make sure this is going to apply to uh, kids in school." So, yeah. Okay. And there's something else I want to um, add that I think is really important that we haven't really discussed in this context is that this is just an evolution in civil rights law. I mean, once upon a time, they would just say, "You're black. You cannot be here." <laughs> That's why we had. Jim Crow laws, right? But people really can't do that anymore. So in many ways, um, prohibitions on certain hairstyles were really just a proxy for race in a world where you couldn't just explicitly say you cannot work here, or you cannot be in this space because of your hair. Now, another um, extension of that and the, um, the general counsel for the Maryland um, you know, Commission on Civil Rights, one of the things um, you know, she shared with us is that it's not just obviously hair on our heads, 
it's also particularly for men, facial hair grooming standards. We often, and I think this is where even some of us as women have a blind spot. If something says you need to be clean shaven, we tend to think, okay, this seems like a permissible expectation for professionalism. But as we, if we stop and pause, right? So many black men or men of color in general who have different, you know, kind of curl textures to their um, facial hair, they may be prescribed by their dermatologist to maintain a low beard to prevent ingrown hairs or other painful or infectious types of skin disorders. So sometimes something as simple as one must be clean shaven to do X might not even be medically like advisable <laughs> for someone because of their their um, their um, hair texture. So that was something that I think you know. There's a lot to be concerned to be concerned about when it comes to grooming standards because they may on their face seem benign if you're looking at it through a lens of being a white person. But once you start broadening the scope and thinking about how this intersects with other identities, things that seem so not a big deal can in fact be a very big deal. And that's why there have been um, you know, uh, different law enforcement officers of color and different people saying, you saying I have to be clean shaven might not be medically advisable. And I think for a lot of people, they wouldn't have thought about that. So these, so a lot of laws um, are gonna have to be, I think, always analyzed um, to make sure that we're being sensitive to um, the, the broader populace and that in many ways, people are trying to find a new way to hold us back because the old ways aren't available to them. So um, that's just something I wanted to lift up to. Can I also just add though to that, Stephanie, the flip side of that is again, so there are definitely bad actors who are very strategic. And we, we all know, we've seen plenty of them in the last year who are just bad actors, particularly in the political space. But I think the other thing is too, is going about uh, is the, the, the ignorance factor um, and, and people who are unintentionally un, ill-informed. And the example I would use is just everything that you said. So there, it was so long that legally we weren't allowed in certain spaces and then legally we were allowed in them, but there weren't many of us. And so I would equate it to the fact that, you know, the bathrooms for women used to not exist in Congress. Then they get bathrooms for women and they're really, really far away. And then it's like, well, I don't understand why this is an issue. Well, if you want me voting on a house floor, I should be able to pop off, go to the bathroom and not have to like walk across a campus to do so, right? And we all saw hidden figures and the whole thing. So the extension of that is similarly when it comes to stuff like this, where there are people who just feel like, the problem was you, we weren't allowed to hire you, we're now hiring you, it should be all good. And then without thinking about the, the, the next part of that, right, which is that if you wanna recruit diverse people and you want them to feel welcome, then you have to be willing to talk about policies like this and change them. And I think it's, it's to your point about like, us finally getting in the door in certain places, they're just now starting to think about things like this. This is an imperfect analogy, but it's similar to the fact that for a lot of women, we've been talking about flex work schedules for years, well over a decade, if you want to keep more women in the workplace. And that's not feasible. That doesn't work. It, the company falls apart. Well, all of a sudden a pandemic happens. And now you have all these companies saying, well, maybe they weren't so off about working from home and flex works, right? No one thought about it till they were forced to confront the issue. And I'm hoping now that we're confronting the issue, we'll see more policies like the one in Maryland expand for the Crown Act across the country. Okay, ladies, we've reached five o'clock. So we have to bring our program to an end, unfortunately, because I could, we could do this all day, I think. Um, but I really want to um, thank Kelly and Stephanie and Delora and Michelle for joining us today and having this very, very important conversation with us. Um, again, like I said, it felt like we were having a conversation with girlfriends because these are the kinds of conversations that we have with each other all the time. So to put a spotlight on it and know that there are people out there advocating for us for these things that are so common when, when sometimes you don't feel seen and, and to know that you guys see us and that you all are fighting you know, for us. Um, it, it really, really, um, really means a lot. So we really wanna thank you all um, for joining us. Um, and uh, if you can uh, put how, cause there are plenty more questions and people want you know, to continue the conversation. So if they can contact you guys on social media or you know whatever your email, Twitter, Instagram, if you could put that um, in the chat box for people, um, so they can know how to contact you and you know continue the conversation. If you don't mind that, we would really appreciate that. Um, I will turn it back over to Madam President Celia Lowe, and thank you again, guys. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. All righty, well, ladies, thank you so much. 
I don't know why my camera keeps going on and off. I've seen that all afternoon, but um, this was awesome. Um, we did have one closeout question. So if you can indulge us, we do want to ask maybe in a minute or less, um, what's next? You know, Kelly, for you as a playwright, Stephanie, for you as a delegate, Delora, for you as an attorney and an advocate, Michelle, as you as an attorney, and as it kind of relates to the hair, the policing of black women's hair and where you see us going um, in years to come. Kelly, you can start. Well, I'm not supposed to share this, but I'm going to, so. Uh, <laughs> wait, come on, Kelly. What time is the video supposed to go up? Cause I'm really not supposed to share, but I could not. But thanks to all of you lovely ladies and other uh, women of color who've embraced this place so much. We're being extended by two weeks. Oh, excellent. So, it's Congratulations. Wonderful. It's, it's, it's a shared victory because, you know, there's so many stereotypes about who does and does not go to the American theater. And the fact that women like you help make this play a success during a pandemic, I think sends a really powerful and strong message, which I'm incredibly grateful for. But my understanding is they're not announcing it until Monday. So I wasn't supposed to say anything, but it did. So <laughs> That's the first thing. And then the second thing is working on the Sex and City reboot. So once the play closes, I'm going to really shift focus to that. And then we're going to focus on trying to get the play out into the world, into other places. So if I, I put the contact page, that's legit. All that mail gets sent to me. So if you have ideas or thoughts or other groups, please let us know. And then the last thing is I have a documentary I'm not supposed to be discussing, but it has very much to do with Black women. And we just uh, closed the holding deal on that like a, like two weeks ago. So that's going to be the thing. Congratulations. I want to that's I'm awesome. We like exclusives. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> You're awesome. awesome. Excellent. Delegate Smith. Thank you so much. So um, one of the things that's just ongoing is just communicating about the Crown Act because it's not a law in the books. People have to know it exists and what it does. So I am just grateful for any opportunity to share kind of what it is and what it does so that people can, um, you know, spread the word. So thank you for providing the opportunity, Celia, for me to do that through this talk back. Um, also, I just wanted to lift up that every single delegate and state senator in Maryland actually has a scholarship program. And um, I think many people are always aware of that. So I'll be accepting applications for um, my scholarship program through the end of May. So you can, um, you know, visit me on my social platforms for more information. Um, and because, you know, I have posts about it, but I, I just want to make sure everyone, no matter where they live, make sure that you contact someone. And it's not just for people that are just graduating from high school. You could be at any age. If you just happen to be, you know, um, gaining additional education beyond high school, um, please, avail yourself of that opportunity and apply to all of the ones that represent you, not just who you like or not, you know, just whoever, they all got money, so you might as well get that money. And then um, the last thing I wanted to lift up is that like for me, it's just really important to give as many opportunities for exposure to the political dynamic to people as possible. So it was challenging, obviously, because we had a largely remote legislature. We, you know, did most of our stuff um, remotely except vote on the floor, but I still had two fantastic, um, um, interns who did some really great stuff remotely. And it's just really important to me for, for me to shape a new, I don't want, I, I don't want to be the only person doing what I'm doing. I want there to be other people, you know, doing what I'm doing. So it's always big to me to give as many people chances because I felt like I was given a lot of chances. I'm a first generation college graduate and I know what it, I know what it feels like to be um, charting a path that seems unclear for you. So if I could be a little bit of a help to someone else and not just berate them about their hairstyle and their clothes. <laughs> Um, I'm happy to do that. So thank you. That is awesome. And thank you for that information. Uh, money. Somebody put in there where the money resides. Yes, yes. Come out of school debt free. That, that's that's another discussion. We're gonna do economic empowerment in a couple of weeks. So excellent, excellent. Yes, Miss Delora. Okay, so um, like the delegate said, if someone is there, there's been lots of discussions and talks about the Crown Act. Um, and I've been participating where asked, but I usually uh, defer to the delegate and say, well, you really should talk to the sponsor. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I, the firm that I am with is a national firm. Um, they work on, so it's, we have, you know, an office in DC, but we also have offices in various states. And just because of all of the gridlock that we've seen in Congress, a lot of times when you want to push political initiatives or policy initiatives, excuse me, um, you do it on a state level, state by state. Uh, because it gets done a lot faster. So um, I actually took on this work um, with the delegate pro bono because it was something that I personally wanted to do. Every session I have a, a personal issue or bill that I work on. 
um, pro bono because it's important to me and usually it is to the benefit of women or, or black people just generally. Um, so uh, Crown Act was my initiative for um, 2020 and uh, you know, do different things, different years. So any assistance that's in other states, I'm also lending political expert, I mean, uh, lobbying expertise to my counterparts across the nation that might be working in different areas. They message me on LinkedIn, they message me or DM me and they say, hey, can we have a chat? And we talk about you know, how to get it done. Uh, so that's ongoing. And um, also just uh, picking, picking different things and make sure that I'm, I'm I'm uplifting the community. So that's it. That is awesome. Oh man, labor of love. That's that's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you for that. Uh, Michelle, thank my you. Madam President. Oh, well, thank you all. So much for, <laughs> for, thank you, Celia, for inviting me and, and having me here. I, I am finishing out um, my year as the president of the Alliance of Black Women Attorneys. Um, I am proud to say that on May the 4th, First, we have our legacy luncheon. We will be honoring this year Judge Mabel House Hubbard. If you don't know, she is the first African American um, Black woman judge in the state of Maryland. Her, wow. It was her 40th anniversary wow. uh, of her appointment to the bench, uh, which was in 1981, so 40 years ago this year. So we are honoring her this year. We have a special program, virtual like program that we are planning for May the 1st. Um, and um, we've had a great, awesome virtual year, um, which was a challenge, but I think we have come through it uh, on the other side in terms of programming and getting together and fellowship and sisterhood. So I'm, I'm really, really excited about that. Um, on a personal level, I was just Senate confirmed to be a commissioner uh, for the Real Estate Commission for the state of wow. Maryland. Yay. Uh, so I, I am doing that in addition to my full-time job and all of my other responsibilities. So I'm excited about that. And, um, you know, I'm just uh, continue to um, represent Baltimore in any way that I can, in the state of Maryland, and also do, doing my work um, with the District of Columbia. I'm looking at getting an MBA and uh, starting a program in 2022. So um, I might be applying for a scholarship. <laughs> 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 but but I'm, I'm waiting to, to take a few months off just to sit quietly for a minute. But yes, that's where I am. But thank you so much for having me here, ladies. You've been awesome. But please join us for the to honor Judge Mabel House Hubbard um, on May 1st. Awesome. Thank you so much, Michelle. Ladies, again, thank you so much for sharing your time, you know, your talent, the words of wisdom. This was such an exciting conversation. When I saw the promotion for the play, I was like, oh my God, this sounds awesome. We got to do something. We got to do something. So I do want to thank my arch um, lead. Like Tia just got like appointed like the day before. I was like, hey, on, by the way, can you make this happen? So she got jumped right on in to the 2 a.m. Celia email club on how we make magic happen in Pearls by the Bay. So thank you for being gracious for saying, uh, yes, Madam President, I I'll get to it. And she did. Um, we have to definitely thank Center Stage. They have been phenomenal. Um, Robin Murphy, I don't know if she Murphy. made it on because she Woo! has been on a road trip with all this promotion. But I, I tell you, I sent her a little text. I was like, hey, girl. You remember me? <laughs> and she was like, oh, okay. And she moved mountains and did magic. Um, so in her absence, I'm not sure if she's on. I just want to say thank you to Robin. She was awesome. Um, this was more than what I could have um, dreamed or imagined. I want to thank our um, hostesses with the most assists. Um, Sir Candace is our connection chair. And so that is all our kind of social action in the word Delta, our social action, political advocacy um, committee. So she's our co-chair and I thought it was great to bring that committee in with the arts and likewise Terry is, our, Terry is our membership chair and so we like to do things we're a sisterhood you know we just want to do service we could do it alone but we actually pledge a sorority because it's a sisterhood and so our activities are branded and so that they're fun and interactive and it was such a great conversation we couldn't keep it to ourselves so Terry was gracious enough to say yes I'll get in on this and I'll, I'll participate so it was like a, a triple header so I do want to thank them for um, being uh, gracious and doing such a good job um, I'm already getting text messages about we need to do a part two and a part three so don't be surprised if I end up calling and texting you all again uh, my tech team as always on point I did a little bit too much tech today I will step out of this lane I have learned my lesson um, you know done that 
check off, got the t-shirt and I'll drink the wine later. But <laughs> I do wanna say, especially to our guests, the chat box conversation was excellent. The questions were really great. I know we couldn't get to everything, um, but we will send out an email tomorrow that will have a survey and it will have some of the material that we wanted to make sure you have, like the program book. Um, the play, as you now know, is still ongoing. You can use the Pearl by the Bay code. It's an excellent, excellent production. I've watched, I think, three times in the last week and a half. It was yeah. so, so, so good. So I really do hope there is a part two and we will start a letter writing campaign to make that happen. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you know, that opportunity to just see yourself in so many ways and Michelle, I related to what you said about talking to witnesses. I was a prosecutor in domestic violence, and that was always the hardest conversation mm -hmm. because typically I wear my hair back in a bun or I wear it straight. And so I don't really get pulled to either side because I'm not really the natural hair people talk about a lot of times when they're making fuss. So for me, I always felt like it was difficult to talk about you're the domestic and he's not guilty. Um, so that was really a trying part as being a prosecutor, trying to be delicate because you don't want to re-victimize a victim. Mm -hmm. So Kelly, I mean, you hit so many poignant parts. Like we were just amen and clapping um, when we were watching. So I want to thank you again for sharing our stories. And for the audience, again, thank you for your wonderful questions and engagement. Sorry we kept you a little bit over. Um, but again, thank you, everyone. I'm going to play the little slideshow from earlier, which you're free to log off. And we'll try and do something else again, because people really seem to be very receptive to this conversation. So Kelly, best wishes on your next thank endeavor. You. I'm and thank excited you. about my... Do, 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 do. So grateful. And look forward to doing this live whenever theaters are open again. Yes, indeed. That would be awesome. That would be awesome. All right, ladies and everyone. Good night. Good night. And thank you again. Have a good one. Thank you so much. You're welcome.